wretched sinner Lost and left to die Raise your head for love is passing by Come to Jesus Come to Jesus Come to Jesus And live Now your burden's lifted And carried far away Precious blood has washed away the stain So sing to Jesus Sing to Jesus Sing to Jesus And live And like a newborn baby Don't be afraid to crawl And remember when you walk, sometimes we fall So fall on Jesus Fall on Jesus Fall on Jesus And live Sometimes the way is lonely Steep and fill with pain So if your sky is dark and pours the rain Then cry to Jesus Cry to Jesus Cry to Jesus And live Oh, and when the love spills over and welcome to worship. We're so glad that you are here for this time of worship. I know we say that every week, but we mean it. We're glad that you are here for this time of worship. The world is a difficult place right now, but you know what? It always has been. We need the Lord. We need to worship. We need to focus on the things that are good and right and true and noble and worthy of praise. We need to focus on the one who never changes, never changes. His love for us never changes, never fades, never fails. He is with us always, Jesus said, to the end of the age. Let me read from Psalm 62 as we begin. Truly my soul finds rest in God, my salvation comes from him. Truly, he is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will never be shaken. Let us pray. Oh Lord, as we gather together for this time of worship, help us to bow the knee and all its worshiping 
to bow the head and all its thinking, to bow the will and all its choosing, to bow the heart and all its loving. O oh Lord, physically, emotionally, mentally, spiritually, we bring all that we are to all that you are. We need you, Lord. We are desperate for you. Please help us to enter into this time of worship with you so that we might be strengthened and transformed to be more and more like Jesus Christ, our Savior. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. There's nothing worth more that could ever come close. No thing can compare. You're our living hope. Your presence, Lord. I've tasted and seen. Of the sweetest of loves Where my heart becomes free And my shame is undone Your presence, Lord Holy Spirit, you are welcome here Come fly Your glory, God, is what 
Hey everybody, so I am offering the children's message again this morning. And what I'm gonna do, I just wanna to talk to you about a practice that we have here in the sanctuary to remind the kids who are not with us right now of something that we do every Sunday morning as we begin our time of worship. It's sort of appropriate that the carillon is playing right now, it's sort of nice, like worship, and I don't know if you can hear it, but it sure is nice and loud and strong in my ears right now. So we light candles in the sanctuary as, be, as we begin our time of worship. We, uh, a child will bring in the light and it's representing the light of Jesus because Jesus said that he is the light of the world. He says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So we bring the light in and we light the candles. And then at the end of worship, we come and we get the light from the candles. And then we take the light back out into the world. Jesus is the light of the world and he calls us to be lights in the world. So I'm going to light the candles in the sanctuary now. I'm going to take you with me. So for those of you who are at home and not able to be with us, um, maybe you remember doing this um, when you were here with us in worship, and I hope it's not very long before all of our kids are back in worship with us. Here we go. So here's the light, and a child will walk up the aisle, the sanctuary. Well, the organist is playing a song. Let me just make sure that we have enough light here. Yep. And people are getting ready for their time of worship. And we come up and we light the candles. They're very easy to light. All you have to do is touch them like that. And then that is reminding us that Jesus said that he is the light of the world and whoever follows him will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So maybe at your house, when we worship, and you're watching the worship video, you could light candles at your house to remind you what Jesus said about being the light of the world. So then at the end of worship, the acolyte, that's what we call it, an acolyte, will come up and he or she will put this, you see this thing? Yeah, it's called a candle lighter. I don't really know what it's called, but that's what we call it. <laughs> And they'll come up and the first thing they do is relight this, okay? And then, see, it's relit. And then we extinguish those candles. And then we go back out, reminding everybody that Jesus is the light of the world. And we too are called to be the light of the world, wherever it is that God sends us. That was a little hard to video. I feel like I needed an extra hand, um, but I think you get the idea. And for those of you who have been privileged to be the accolade here, you remember what it was like. And it's not just lighting the candles. It's a symbol of the light of Christ who is in the world and who, when we put our trust in him, his light is within us, and we're called to take that light wherever we go. Let's pray. Oh, Lord, we thank you that you are the light of the world. We thank you for your promise that when we follow you, we will never walk in darkness. Help us to be your light in this world, Lord. Thank you for shining the light on our path so we know which way to go. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, thanks, friends. I'm glad that you were with me today, and I'll see you next time. Come behold the wondrous mystery in the 
dawning of the King, keep the theme of heaven's praises, robed in frail humanity. In our longing, in our darkness, now the light of life has come. Look to Christ who condescended, took on flesh to ransom This week we continue in the sermon series titled A Sense of Urgency, taken from the Gospel of Mark in chapter 4, which contains the most extended ongoing teaching section of Jesus in Mark's writing. And here we see Jesus teaching in four stories about soil, but explaining in a different style and direction from his previous parables, and that is to not reveal truths, but to hide truths from those who do not have hearts to hear and receive the truth. Now our text for the day is about your ears and my ears, and more importantly, how well they listen to and hear spiritual truth. And thus, if we consider the first question from Lori at the end of last week's sermon, the question is, Are we eager to be with Jesus? And then if we are eager disciples, we need to listen with our ears and our hearts so that we may understand the teaching of Jesus about the mystery of the kingdom of God. But before I unpack today's message, let's take time to pray. So Lord, give us ears to hear and hearts to receive today's word. 
Help us to lean forward toward you and sit at your feet so that we might find a closer relationship with you. And Lord, please help us not only to be hearers of the word, but also doers. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing to you, O Lord. Amen. Now, following along in our text, Jesus is still in Capernaum, where the scribes are continuing with their unhappiness about Jesus' teaching. And the crowds are pressing in on him, and more people are showing up to see whom this Jesus is. The crowds, they're showing up in craziness to find healing or to find some secret bit of knowledge. And we learn that Jesus is in a boat, and he's a little offshore, and he's taking advantage of the great acoustics that comes with being on a boat. And it's giving him space away from the crowds. Now, in addition, this allows Jesus to teach to a larger audience. Now, imagine a group along the shore and others in boats trying to get near to Jesus. So, if you have your Bibles, let's look at the text beginning in Mark chapter 4, verses 1 through 20. Again, Jesus began to teach by the lake. The crowd that gathered around him was so large that he got into a boat and sat in it out on the lake, while all the people were along the shore at the water's edge. He taught them many things in parables, and in his teaching he said, Listen, a farmer went out to sow his seed, and as he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path. And the birds came up and ate it. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seeds fell among thorns which grew up and choked the plants so that they did not bear grain. Still other seeds fell on good soil. It came up, grew, and produced a crop, some multiplying 30, some 60, some a 100 times. And then Jesus said, Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. Now, in this next section, beginning in verse 10, we notice a change in the scenery. And Jesus is with a smaller group, alone with the closest and those who are most committed to him. And in addition, what we see from Mark is this group pursuing Jesus in steps of faith entering into a relationship with him, not for show, but for real. So they ask him the follow-up question about the parable. Therefore, Jesus lets them in on a secret about himself and the majesty of the kingdom of God. When he was alone, the twelve and the others around him asked him about the parables, and he told them, the secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you. But to those on the outside, everything is said in parables, so that they may ever seeing but never perceiving, and ever hearing but never understanding, otherwise they might turn and be forgiven. And then Jesus said to them, Don't you understand this parable? How then would you understand any parable? The farmer sows the word. Some people are like seeds along the path where the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. Others, like seeds sown on rocky places, hear the word and at once receive it with joy. But since they have no root, they only last a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. And still others, like seeds sown among thorns, they hear the word. 
but the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth and desires for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. Others, like seed sown on good soil, hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop. Some 30, some 60, some 100 times what was sown. And here ends the reading. So the question is, what is the secret of the kingdom of God? Unfortunately for some in my mind, primarily unbelievers with hard, hollow, or hindered hearts, they believe that Mark never reveals to them what the secret is. And alternatively, does Mark show it somewhere else in another way, a bit more obscure but plainly stated? I think so. I think he does. The identity of Jesus as king back in the very beginning of Mark, chapter 1, verse 1, that says, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. But however, I also believe that Mark is writing to tell the world who Jesus is. Announcing his words and works in a straightforward approach. Now, if we go back to verse 3, Jesus says, listen. In verse 12, Jesus speaks of those who may indeed hear, but not understand. In verse 20, Jesus speaks of those who hear the word and accept it and bear fruit. So here is something to ask yourselves. Do you have ears that hear? And if so, what is it that we need to hear? You see, as disciples of Jesus Christ, we must sow the seed of the gospel so that people might hear the word. We do not need to speak in parables for those who listen to, but use everyday objects, events, and circumstances to illustrate spiritual truth. However, the challenge begins with teaching to receptive ears that hear, leading to a spiritually alert and hungry mind and heart. And as sowers of the word, we must draw attention to Jesus as God's Messiah, which calls us as hearers to make a personal decision concerning Christ. As we read from the text, the background or historical situation is relevant to sowing seed preceded by plowing. Now, in likeness to farming, the kingdom of God will break into this world like seed being sown by a farmer through the preaching of the gospel. The seed is sown, then plowed into the soil. Now, I know many of you listening are from the valley and most likely have roots in farming or gardening and realize the kind of soil the seed or seeds require for growth. We, we go back to verse 4, the path. Verse 5 and 6, the rocky ground. Verse 7, among thorns. And verse 8, good and productive soil. The main point appears clear that we must sow the seed of the gospel so others might hear and respond. And response will vary from one person to another depending on not so much the sower, but the soil on which the seed lands. If we do not listen to the word, we will not benefit 
from the gospel was stated in Mark 4, verses 10 through 12. We see those around Jesus, his closest comrades, they ask Jesus, why do you speak in parables? And sometimes when reading the scriptures, we can find ourselves asking the very same question. And well, Jesus replies, quoting from Isaiah 6, verses 9 through 10, that drives home the point that the scriptures are fulfilled in him. In him, in Jesus. Now I want you to listen to these words that are taken from the Message Bible in a clear voice. He said, Go and tell these people, listen hard, but you aren't going to get it. Look hard, but you won't catch on. Make these people blockheads with fingers in their ears and blindfolds on their eyes so they won't see a thing. They won't hear a word. So they won't have a clue about what's going on. And yes, so they won't turn around and be made whole. Now, don't you just feel the love of the term blockheads? I know my buddy John does. So what is it that Jesus is saying and what does he mean? Well, here is my point concerning Mark and his writing. That Mark wants the reader to know who Jesus is and the insight into the secrets of the kingdom of God. In Mark's enthusiasm and immediacy of writing, Mark outlines that people outside of the faith are not denied to find belief. But still, if they persist in unbelief, they will not receive more. They will not receive more. And verse 25 clarifies the secret, which says, Love the word, and you will get more. Refuse the word, and even what you have, you will lose. So what is the secret of the kingdom? It's God's present kingdom plan of sowing of his holy word. That is the secret of the kingdom. <clears throat> when we examine the parable of the soils, the foundational nature of the parable comes forth. <clears throat> For if one does not understand this one, they will struggle to understand all of the others. I mean, look at it this way. if It's like math, adding or subtracting. If we cannot understand the simplistic foundation, foundational nature of math, then multiplying or dividing are certainly unobtainable. So let us examine the soils where the feed set, seed fell. Number one, the seed that fell on the hard path produces nothing. Nothing. Remember the sower is not just Jesus, but all who proclaim the word, and the seed is the word of God. Skeptics of God's word are unresponsive, and their hearing is superficial. In the end, the word is immediately, immediately lost. And people hear the word, the book closes, and when the service ends, so do their ears and their hearts. Number two, the rocky ground produces shallow hearts. You know, some people hear the word, receive it with joy, but the word does not grow and eventually falls away. And people give up here today and gone tomorrow. And this example of shallow soil reminds me of tending creation festival where I would see eager listeners make a quick profession of faith. They would lift a hand and without thinking, say a fast yes, without considering what, what 
it all means. Some people cannot fully commit to the Christian lifestyle, and people are initially attracted to a joyful noise, a joyful noise, but give up when the going gets tough. Number three, the thorny soil chokes the message of God producing distracted hearts. Those who receive the word but eventually become distracted by worry, wealth, or lust. In essence, since this life is more important than the life to come where the pleasures and desires and a self-centered legacy of this earthly life override the desire to be near Jesus. Lastly, number four, the good soil produces fruitful hearts and a strong faith. As disciples of Jesus, seeking Jesus, we must hear, accept, and bear fruit. The worries and concerns of this life are not distractions, but because hearing is active by aggressively pursuing the word and allowing the word to take root. The vision of Upper Path Valley Church, our vision to ignite a deep rooted passion for Christ in future generations. I would say in this generation too. Gospel of John 15, 5 says it all. I am the vine, you are the branches. Therefore, if you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. As I close, the only questions I have for you to consider are these. Do you have ears that work correctly? Do you tune the words of scripture in or out? And what you do with the word of God, it is critical, critical to your soul. Our challenge to you is to go after God's word, to grab hold of it and don't let it go. Like a starving beggar who has found bread, seize it and cherish it for the life-sustaining food, the life-sustaining food that it is. Everyone who has ears to hear, let them hear. I encourage each one of you to connect with a Bible study or a small group. For it's there that you can learn. You and I can learn about God's word. Peace be with you. Amen.
I can hear the sower's song Abide in me Let these branches bear you fruit Abide in me, Lord Let your word take root Remove in me The branch that bears no fruit And move in me, Lord As I abide in you As the rain and the snow fall down from the sky and they don't return but they water the earth and they bring forth life giving seed to the sower and bread for the hunger so shall the word of the Lord be with a sound like thunder and it will not return it will not return void we shall be led in peace and go out with joy and the hills before us will raise their voices And the trees of the field will clap their hands as the land rejoices And instead of the thorn now, the cypress towers And instead of the briar, the myrtle blooms with a thousand flowers And it will make a name, make a name for our God a sign everlasting that will never be cut off As the earth brings forth, sprouts from the sea What is sown in the garden grows into a mighty tree So the Lord plants justice, justice and praise To rise before the nations till the end of day pray. Grant us, O oh God, the fullness of your promises. Where we have been weak, grant us your strength. Where we have been confused, grant us your guidance. Where we have been distraught, grant us your comfort. Where we have been dead, grant us your life. Apart from you, O oh Lord, we are nothing. But in and with you, we can do all things. We know that we have fallen into times of being negative. We have fallen into times of despair. We have fallen into times of only seeing what's wrong around us. Oh, Lord, lift up our heads. Remind us of your light that shines in the darkness. Lord, we pray for those who are sick, who are suffering in any way, we pray for the grieving. We pray for the lonely. We lift up the hungry, the thirsty. We pray for those who need hope. May they know the hope that you alone can give, a hope that goes beyond this world. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, receive the benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with his favor and grant you peace. 
today and every day. Thanks be to God. Amen. Bye.